My name is Lisa Rowe Frostino, and I am in the English department here at Eastern, and it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the student who will introduce our speaker, Patricia Haggard. Hi, I'm not real sure how I got this honor, but it is quite an honor. And today I was very lucky and able to spend the day with Miss Gail Carson Levine. Um, it's been a great day, and I'm really excited to be able to present her here for all of you. She's a great person besides a great author. Um, I learned some things about her today. She has a dog that she loves very much. I also learned that she is a an avid blogger. So any of you that love to blog, look her up online, gailcarsonlevine.blogspot.com. <laughs> um, and she's here today to share with us some of the books that she's written and hopefully some of the secrets that she has hidden behind these fabulous books. So I want to welcome today Miss Gail Carson Levine. Am I, I'm on. Ah, okay, great. Um, hi, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this, and Lisa, thank you for inviting me, this is wonderful. I'm gonna do something a little bit complicated. I'm going to read from each book very briefly and then tell you a secret about every one. So I'm going to start with the first, my first published book, which was Ella Enchanted. Um, and this is the beginning of Ella. That fool of a fairy, Lucinda, did not intend to lay a curse on me. She meant to bestow a gift. When I cried inconsolably through my first hour of life, my tears were her inspiration. Shaking her head sympathetically at mother, the fairy touched my nose. My gift is obedience. Ella will always be obedient. Now stop crying, child. I stopped. So that's from the beginning of Ella Enchanted. And um, when I started writing it, I was taking a new class at the new school, which um, was a legendary class at the time, taught by a woman named Margaret Bunny Gable. We all called her Bunny. And uh, she taught it for 30 years. You may know uh, the work of Patricia Riley Gith. How many of you know her work? Okay, she was one of Bunny's students. And a lot of us passed through her class. I was taking it for the first time, and um, I didn't know what to write. And I, so I thought I might try a Cinderella story, because I had just read Beauty by Robin McKinley. How many of you have read that book? It's a fabulous retelling of Beauty and the Beast. So I started writing, and it took me a while to come up with the curse. But after I came up with the curse, I was writing, and I gave Bunny my first chapter. And this is how the class worked. Um, you could, at the end of one class, you gave her the work that you'd done the week during the week. Or if there had been a break, the novel that you'd written over the summer. <laughs> and a novel she might take a few weeks with, but if you gave her 20 pages, the next week she'd give it back to you with an editorial letter, single spaced, which might be several pages, which might be a few paragraphs, and line edits throughout the manuscript. Line edits for the kids are corrections. They're like what a teacher does to, to make your work better. So that's what she would do. And in each class, she would read one of the, she would read three of the students' work. And she would ask what the students thought of the, of the work. And then she would give her own criticism. And with Ella, she read the first chapter, and everybody in the class loved it, except Bunny. <laughs> and so Bunny did not like it. And she said it was very smooth. And she didn't mean that as a compliment. And I was really, um, I valued her opinion, and I was quite upset, and I was going to abandon it. And if not for my husband, and this is the secret, I gave him the first 20 pages to read, and he loved them. And I kept writing. And then Bunny came around, and she loved it too. But at the beginning, she didn't. And so that's how Ella 
became a book. Now this one is David Knight, um, which is my only um, novel that has no fantasy in it. Ha and it's about a boy who's an orphan, who how many of you have read David Knight? Okay. Um, it's about a boy who's an orphan, who's sent to an orphanage to live. And, um, and only a couple of you have read it. It is one of my, le it's I, one of my favorite of my books, but it's one of my least known because it's unlike the others. Um, and I wrote it because my father was an orphan and he was sent to an orphanage to live and he would not talk about it. Um, so, and, and he died, he died before I started writing. So um, I decided in this book to make up his childhood. And it started as an eight page fantasy picture book. <laughs> and there's no fantasy left and it's over 200 pages. It was the first novel, it and Ella are the two books that I learned to write novels on. Um, and I don't really have a secret about David Knight. So what I did bring is two photographs. And my father, can anybody guess why my father, who was an orphan, might not have talked about his childhood? Anybody take a guess? Yeah, what do you think? It was sad to think about, yes. I think it was very sad to think about, thank you, yes. He didn't like talking about it probably because it was sad. My father, yes. He may not have thought it was that interesting. That's possible. It's possible, although, you know, I was certainly fascinated by it. Um, so he died and I didn't know. My father had this very rough, kind of sad childhood, although the book is an adventure story. Um, my father was the happiest person I've ever known. And so part of why I told the book, wrote the book was to explain his happiness. So I brought a picture of my father. I don't know if you can see his sweetness in this picture, which means a lot to me. And the other truly, totally secret picture I'm showing you is my wedding day. Ooh. This is uh, both my mother and my father and me and my husband on, unfortunately, we're a little whited out, but, ah, that helps. Uh, good, good. Um, yeah. So there we are. And that's David Knight's secret. Um, okay, so. And I failed to read to you from David Knight. So I'm going to read from the very beginning. Um, from the start, I've always made trouble. My mama died of complications from having me. I once joked about it to my older brother Gideon. I said I could make trouble even before I was born. Gideon thought I was serious because he said, you didn't do it on purpose, Dave. You were too young. You weren't even yourself yet. No, I didn't do it on purpose, but probably I was fooling around in her belly, having a fine time, and I kicked or punched too hard, and one thing led to another, and she died. So that's the beginning of Dave at Night, and it gets happier. Um, <laughs> so then next, this is the beginning of the fairy's mistake. And these are my princess tale stories, which are anthologized in this book called The Fairy's Return. So, once upon a time, in the village of Snettering on Snokes, in the kingdom of Biddle, Rosella fetched water from the well for the 4,088th time. So that's the beginning. And this is a retelling of the fairy tale or an adaptation, I'm learning. It's really an adaptation <laughs> of the fairy tale Toads and Diamonds. How many of you know Toads and Diamonds? Okay. Um, and this one, this is the secret. This one started out as a picture book that nobody would publish. 
and um, Toads and Diamonds is about two sisters. One is very ugly and one is very pretty. And the sister who is very pretty is also very sweet. And the mother is also very ugly. And this ugly mother and the ugly sister are very mean. So what happens at the beginning of the story is that the sweet, pretty sister has to do all the work. And, um, and she has to go to the well to fetch water for the family. When she goes to the well, there is an old lady there who is really a fairy in disguise. The old lady asks her to give her water. The sweet, pretty one says, oh, certainly, grandmother, and gives her the water. And the fairy rewards her by making jewels and flowers come out of her mouth whenever she speaks. And she goes home. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. But she goes home, and she talks. And so the jewels and the diamonds start showing up in her mouth. And she goes outside. Um, and she's met by a passing prince. And the jewels and the diamonds are uh, slipping delicately from her lips. <laughs> and um, the prince sees how pretty and sweet she is, falls madly in love with her, and asks her to marry him, and figures that the jewels can be her dowry. It seemed to me when I read this as a grown up that. I wasn't so sure what he was falling in love with. <laughs> what else do you think that prince might have been falling in love with? And not so much her pretty sweetness. What do you think? The jewels. Yeah, he is falling in love with those jewels. So that's how I tell the story. And I make them twins. So one isn't pretty and one isn't ugly. They're both OK. <laughs> um, so. Um, so the rejection. Now, I was, got rejection letters for nine years. How many of you are writing? Um, and how many of you are hoping to get published? OK. I was writing, and I was thinking editors were gods, and they knew what they were talking about. And when I got a rejection, it was coming from on high, and, and I was judged. And then I got this rejection letter, and it said my story was too clever. And so they were rejecting it. So that's the secret. And that sort of opened my eyes a little bit about um, editors. <laughs> so the next one is um, the princess test. And that is, um, this starts out very similarly. Once upon a time in the village of Snettering on Snokes, in the kingdom of Biddle, a blacksmith's wife named Gussie gave birth to a baby girl. Gussie and her husband Sam named the baby Lorelei, and they loved her dearly. Lorelei's smile was sweet, and her laughter was music. But as an infant, she smiled only four times and laughed twice. <laughs> the rest of the time, she cried. <laughs> so this is a retelling anybody Guess what this might be a retelling of, the princess test? Can anybody think of a fairy tale in which somebody has to take a test? Yes. Yes, the princess in the pea. And is Lorelei a true princess? She's a blacksmith's daughter. You think she's a true princess? No. <laughs> but we have to see how she does on the princess test. So the secret, this is, this is two secrets on this. One is both of them very quick. Um, one is that my influences, my humor influences, are my mother, who was very funny, and my husband, who gave me humor lessons. <laughs> so that, those are my humor influences. And the other secret is when I was telling, and this is uh, a little, I was telling this to some kids. And a boy came up to me afterwards, and he said to me, what happened to the pea? And after he said that and started to explain what he meant, I realized he was thinking of the wrong meaning of P. <laughs> so, um, 
So that's another secret. <laughs> this one is Princess Sonora and the Long Sleep. What fairy tale do you think Princess Sonora, yes. Sleeping Beauty, absolutely. So at the beginning of Sleeping Beauty, there's the christening with all those fairies. So this is how it starts. What a hideous baby, the fairy Arabella thought. She said, my gift to Sonora is beauty. She touched the baby's yellow squished up face with her wand. The baby began to change. Her scrawny arms and legs became plump and her blotchy yellow skin turned pink. Her pointy head became round. Honey colored ringlets appeared on her scalp. Ouch! It hurt to have your body change shape and to grow hair on your head in 10 seconds. Sonora wailed. Okay, so, oh, and that's the same picture, okay. Um, and what I was thinking about this is um, in telling these stories, which are in their original four pages long maybe, what I'm doing is slowing them down so that we see the crazy leaps of logic in these fairy tales. Like, for example, who thinks it's a sensible test to pick the future ruler of her country? Who thinks this is a sensible test by seeing if she can feel a pee under 20 mattresses? Okay, who thinks this is not a sensible test? Okay, so, um, so I'm exposing, I'm showing the reader, what kind of test is this? So that's, um, that's one secret. Another secret is that one of the gifts that this character, Sonora, is given is she's made smarter. I think, I can't remember, either 10 times smarter or 100 times smarter than anybody else on Earth. And then there's the matter of um, love at first sight in fairy tales. And Sleeping Beauty is a very crazy example of love at first sight. Because in Sleeping Beauty, this prince goes through this um, very scary hedge to get to a princess he's only heard about. And when he sees her, she, all he knows about her when he sees her is that she's pretty and she doesn't snore. <laughs> So that's not good enough for me. So I have this very brilliant princess, and I needed a prince who was primed to fall in love with her. And so he's not stupid, but he's ordinary smart. He's smart, but he's not 100 times smarter than anybody else. But he is 100 times more curious. He's always asking questions that nobody can answer. And so, um, He's primed, he hears about this sleeping princess who can answer all his questions. And that's why he's willing. And she is, well, I don't want to, I don't want to give away the secret of what she looks like when he sees her. <laughs> but anyway, um, the secret here is that I think that this Sonora and the Prince Christopher are my parents. My mother was like a hundred times smarter than anybody else on earth. <laughs> and my father loved her brilliance. And they loved each other. They were a love match their whole life, just about. And, um, and it was that combination, my father's admiration and my father's innocence and my mother's brilliance. So, okay, next is Cinderella. I'm still working on the princess tales. So Cinderella and the Glass Hill. And Cinderella is a male Cinderella. Um, and I wanted to call him, here's a, my editor is no longer there. I wanted to call him, him Cinder Elmer. Um, and I guess it is funny, she talked me out of it. Ellis was always lonely. He lived with his older brother Ralph and Bert on a farm that was across the moat from Biddle Castle. Ralph and Bert were best friends as well as brothers, but they wouldn't let Ellis be a best friend too. When he was six years old, Ellis invented flying powder. 
he sprinkled the powder on his tin cup, and the cup began to rise up the chimney. So Ellis is an inventor, and it's also a tall tale. And, um, and the only secret about this one is how hard to, it was to write. I love tall tales as a kid, so that's why I made him an inventor. It was hardest to write because all these magical horses show up over a period of six years. And I had to deal with that period of time. And I also took it in my head that the horses needed to talk and be funny. And those horses could not crack a joke. <laughs> so I failed. But I, it managed to come together in the end. And so that's the secret, <laughs> such as it is. This is, um, this is for Biddle's sake. And this is my favorite. This is based on a very little known fairy tale called Puddocky. Has anybody ever read the fairy tale called Puddocky? Puddocky is an archaic, which means that it no longer exists. It's an old English word meaning toad. So um, when she was two years old, Patsy tasted a sprig of parsley at a traveling fair. I'm going to read a little more about of this one, I think. Um, no, maybe not. Um, anyway, when she was two years old, Patsy tasted a sprig of parsley at a traveling fair. She loved it. And from that moment on, the only food she would eat was parsley. After a while, her parents, Nellie and Zeke, began to call her that, parsley. The trouble was that parsley grew in only one spot in the village of Snettering on Snokes, and that spot was the garden of the fairy Bambina, who was renowned for turning people into toads. So, does anybody notice a similarity between the beginning here and the beginning of another fairy tale? What is that? Yes, excellent. Um, so, in this case, parsley, and I made this up, parsley keeps eating parsley, and she has the most delightful smile, which expose her teeth, which are stained a pretty bright green. <laughs> so, um, and the, the secret of this one is that parsley gets turned into a toad. And she has to, she's visited, she's found by a prince. And she has to help this prince. And he needs, a, he needs three things, one after another, in separate incidents. He needs um, a length of cloth that's so fine that it can go through a ring. He needs a dog that's so small that it can fall and fit into a walnut. And he needs the most beautiful princess in the world. And this toad has to give him these three things. And I had to figure out how she could do that. And that was the hardest thing. And I don't want to give it away, but that was the hardest thing about writing this book. And when I figured out how this toad could make this cloth and could um, make the dog, I was really happy. Um, now this one, The Fairy's Return. Um, once upon a time, in the kingdom of Biddle, a baker's son and a princess fell in love. This is how it came about. Robin, the baker's son, rode to Biddle Castle in the back of the bakery cart. His older brothers, Nat and Matt, sat on the driver's bench with their father, Jake, who was a poet as well as a baker. Robin began a joke. Son, Jake said, and this is, so, Robin began a joke. What's a dwarf's son, Jake said, interrupting him. And so Jake then says one of his poems, and this is one of his poems. A joker is a fool who never went to a place of learning. <laughs> 
So it's full of poems exactly as good as that. <laughs> so, um, and the secret um, is that this is the retelling of the, um, the Golden Goose. And I had a lot of trouble with it because it's already funny. And I was miserable. My editor got me, um, got me out of it. She got me to be able to write it. But the secret is that in her editorial letter, she told me that my heroine was a buffoon. <laughs> and she did not mean it as a compliment. <laughs> and uh, that was a little hard to take, but she was right. And she helped me get her not to be a buffoon. She's funny, but she's not a buffoon. OK, so here is the wish. So I need to change the book. Um, the wish. And this is a prologue. And one of you in class today had a prologue. And um, I think prologues are great. But when I go and talk to kids, of the kids who are here, how many of you, when you see a prologue, skip it? Raise your hand. OK. So that's the problem with prologues. But anyway, this is from the prologue. The old lady looked wildly and feeble. The minute our subway train started, she was going to keel over. Then she'd be a sick passenger, and the train would stop while we waited for an ambulance, and I'd be late for school. Plus, she looked terrified. I gave her my seat. I helped her into it. Thank you, dear. You have done me a good turn. She didn't have an old lady's voice. Her, her tones were as round and juicy as an anchor woman's. So I'll stop there. <laughs> OK. So the wish is about popularity in the eighth grade. And Wilma, the main character, is not popular. And she is desperate to be popular. Um, and this is the secret. And that is that the people in my class, I was still taking a writing class at the time, were very troubled that I had this main character who cared so much about popularity, which they felt was not such a worthy thing to care about. I'm not sure myself how worthy it is to care about. But it is what she cared about. And so I needed to be faithful to this character that I invented. And this is what she cares about. Um, for those of you who are interested in this, um, oh, and it's also my favorite book for dialogue. I think my dialogue in that book is better than any place else. And Wilma, in this search, she just about begs people to like her. It, there are moments where it kind of makes you cringe. Um, then I was teaching at the local middle school, and I was teaching some eighth graders. I was a volunteer. I was teaching creative writing. And after they read, um, they read the book, my eighth graders, two of them, came to me and said they liked the book very, very much but they needed to tell me there was too much kissing in it. <laughs> so if you don't like that, you should stay away from it. If you do, it's the book to go to. <laughs> OK, so um, next is uh, Two Princesses of Bamar. OK, um, and here. Um, this is the beginning. Out of a land laid waste, to a land untamed, monster-ridden, the lad Druald led a ruined ragtag band. In his arms, tenderly, he carried Bruce, the child king, first ruler of Bamar. So begins Druald, the epic poem of Bamar's greatest hero, our kingdom's ideal. Druald fought for Mars monsters, the ogres, griffins, specters, and dragons that still plague us. And he helped his sovereign found our kingdom. Today, Bamar needed a hero more than ever. The monsters were slaughtering hundreds of Bamarians every year. 
and the gray death carried away even more. So this is about two sisters in a very dangerous world. And one of them, Meryl, is very brave. And the other one, Addie, is very timid. These two sisters adore each other. And, um, and the brave sister comes down with the gray death, which is fatal. But there's a prophecy that it can be cured someday. Um, when cowards find courage and rain falls over Albemarle are the two conditions to, um, to cure the gray death. So Addie, who is a terrified character, sets off in search for the cure for her sister, bringing with her some magical things to help her. The secret about this is that I get letters from sisters who write that the book is so important to them because they adore their sister and they're so close and it means so much to them. And so then I laugh and I think about how much my sister hated me <laughs> during my whole childhood and how she wanted to kill me and I'm only alive because deep down she's a really nice person. <laughs> so I also brought a photograph. My sister is a painter. She paints West Indian subjects. I may need you to shield the lamp again. Um, anyway, she paints West Indian subjects. Her name is Ronnie Carson, and she's a fabulous painter, and I'm very proud of her. So I thought you might like to see um, one of her paintings. This does not do it justice. She works in gouache. Um, so anyway, I will also just hold it up. Um, so we are very close today. I'm very glad she was not killed by the Gray Death. Um, but I do laugh when I get those letters. Anyway, so next is, I don't know what, is fairy dust. Okay. Um, fairy dust and the quest for the egg, which has a different cover in paper than it had in uh, hardcover. When baby Sarah Quirtle laughed for the first time, the laugh burbled out of her and flitted through her window. It slid down the side of her house and pranced along her quiet lane. It took a right on Water Street and frolicked on to the wide sea that separated the mainland from Neverland. There, the laugh set out, skipping from the tip top of one wave to the tip top of the next. So this very lovely idea of the laugh burbling out of the baby and going over the sea. And eventually, does anybody know what happens to this laugh? Yes. It turns into, it turns into the fairy prilla. So fairies in Neverland start out as laughs, which is a wonderful idea, and I didn't make it up. It was James M. Barry who made up that idea of fairies starting with a baby's first laugh. It's a delightful idea. Um, this secret is um, a little bit, this has nothing to do with the book itself. It's personal. Um, and I'll tell you just, I was, before I became a children's book writer, for 27 years, I was a New York State government employee. I was sort of a mid-level uh, office worker. And um, to promote this book, Disney is really very powerful at promotion. And one of the things, and I grew up in New York City, and um, one of the things that they did was that they put an ad for it on one of the jumbotrons at Times Square. And so it was an ad for the book with my name on it. And it rotated and it came up every 20 minutes. And it was in the winter, and I went to Times Square. I, I go to New York a lot, and I went to Times Square, and they never saw it. So I called the publicist, and I arranged for me to be there at a certain time when um, they would play it over and over again, so I would be sure to catch it. So I was there at 4 in, four in the afternoon. It was getting dark. Um, I think it was December. 
and I st it was cold. I stood across the street in, an, in a, an office building, and I looked out. And there, uh, on Times Square, was my name, was a book I'd written and my name. And you know, Times Square, nobody was looking at it. People were yelling at each other, <laughs> screaming into their cell phones, buying newspapers. Uh, panhandlers were panhandling. But there I was, a child of New York City, watching my name show up over and over again. And many incredible things have happened to me since I've become published. But somehow that one absolutely took the cake. And I'm not crying now. When I first practiced this speech, I was crying when I was <laughs> telling you about it. So that's the secret about this one. Um, OK. Betsy, who cried wolf, is um, next. This is my only picture book, but it will be soon joined by another Betsy book. And um, so what I have to do here is um, I'm going to read you a little bit from just the end papers. The, the illustrator gave this to me as a gift. Um, let me see. You can see this here. He, he put the sheep and he put, wait, I had it better before, there. He put the sheep and he put the wolves up on two legs. And he gave them word balloons, which I didn't do. And so I then had to fill them in, which I loved. So I'm going to read you from the end papers what the sheep and the lambs are saying. So the first sheep says, I think I swallowed a bug. The second sheep says, the grass here is really sweet. The, sec the third sheep says, but it's greener over there. <laughs> um, the next sheep says, when I was a lamb, I was polite to my shepherd. The next sheep says, we can outrun her. The lamb says, I hope the new shepherd isn't strict. So that's from... Um, Betsy who cried wolf, and let me see what the secret is. Um, oh, the story of the boy who cried wolf, if you remember that story. The boy, I agree, is a liar. And two times he says there's a wolf when there's no wolf. But that community lets him keep on hurting. And it seems to me, if they don't come when he cries wolf the third time, they're deserting him. I think that boy was abandoned by that community. And, um, and so when I wrote it, I wanted to fix it. And so the mother is the one who helps Betsy in, in my original, Against the Wolf. And then my editor rejected it. And she said, because the mother is doing all the acting here. The mother, and um, the mother is a baker, so Betsy, so the mother brings pies to throw at the wolf. And, um, and Betsy and the mother throw pies at the wolf, which is not in this story. Um, and I figured it out, and it didn't get rejected. But um, that's one secret, that it was rejected. And the second secret is that I wouldn't have written it if I hadn't thought of shepherd's pie. <laughs> so that was the joke that got me started. Thank you. What's next? Um, Which? Fairest. Fairest. OK, fairest. OK, fairest, uh, um, OK. I was born singing. Most babies cry. I sang an aria. OK, so that's the beginning of Ferris. And what I have, want to read to you is that Ferris is a retelling of Snow White. And um, so where am I? OK, Ferris. Um, it's the first book that I wrote with the editor that I have now. And um, I love her. I love her. 
but I thought that you might be interested. After she got fairest, she sent me an editorial letter, and it was single-spaced, and it was 17 pages long. <laughs> and so I thought you might like to hear me read a little bit of the editorial letter that I got for Ferrist. You'll see that I've made recommendations for deletions throughout. These are suggestions, and they are intended to help you in cutting the story, which, as I told you, is very, very necessary. It is such a marvelous story, but it is often buried under the sheer weight of the tale, buried under unnecessary scenes and retellings of events that are not crucial to the plot, and under sections of Aza's commentary. Cutting will help you show rather than tell, and that is something that you need to look for throughout the story. Passages that could be written in a more immediate and direct fashion. So I thought that pointing out the unnecessary or overlong passages would help you more than just saying, please cut about 150 pages from this story. <laughs> so that was my first experience with Rosemary. <laughs> so, um, so that's the secret of Ferris. And I probably cut more than that. Um, and, uh, and it's a better book for it. <laughs> OK. So next is um, my first response on getting a letter like that is feeling that I don't know if I can do it. It's really being scared. Um, so. Um, it's not generally, it's rarely she's wrong. You know, she's been wrong about a few things, but overall it's not she's wrong, she doesn't understand me. It's more, ah, can I do this? Um, okay, writing magic, where are you? Okay. Here is writing magic. Do you have, a, you have something for writing don't magic? Don't have Mrs. Me, no, don't it is, it's just different. Yes. There it is, okay. This is... Not the very beginning. This is the writer's oath in writing magic. I promise solemnly to write as often and as much as I can, to respect my writing self, and to nurture the writing of others. I accept these responsibilities and shall honor them always. In the original edition, before my editor got to me, <clears throat> I think there was blood involved, but she <laughs> talked me out of that. Um, so. Writing magic, what's the secret? Um, it was just that most of it comes from my writing sessions at the middle school. And the exercises are all the ones that I did, or not all of them, but most of them are ones that I did with the kids. And we made a lot of discoveries in those exercises. So we discovered, for example, I brought in um, an object one time, could have, been, could have been this. And I had us describe it, leaving nothing out. And the discovery was it wouldn't be interesting, but you could write infinity about anything. That you, the level of detail that you can get to, if you're trying to get to a level of detail, is endless. And that was a discovery for all of us. Um, OK. Fairy Haven and the Quest for the Wand. Okay, I'm going to read. Oh, oh, goodness. It starts with a song, and it's the mermaid song. So, um, sometimes I do well, I'm a little hoarse, sometimes I bomb, but I'm going to sing for you. <laughs> It is a very sad song. Oh, I didn't switch the books. Um, it is a very sad song. It's being sung by Soup the Mermaid. And um, and so I need your help. If you would um, clap very slowly while I sing to show how sad this is. OK, start.
Thank you. Now, this has no tune because I'm not real good at carrying a tune. Um, and I'm, I'm, I sang this right after, at a, at a book fair, right after Julie Andrews got off the stage. <laughs> so, um, the meaning, books have meanings for me. Um, and this one is about, um, about greed. I think I'm writing another one about greed right now. But um, the secret is that um, the fairies have to get a wand for Soup the Mermaid. And wands are really dangerous because you can get whatever you want. And, um, and there's danger in that. Why do you think that might be dangerous? Anybody have any thoughts about why it might be dangerous? Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, there's nothing else to quest for, yeah. Yeah, if you have everything you want. Um, there are other, um, there are conditions with this wand and reversing a wish is not so easy. So if you, if you <clears throat> have second thoughts about what you think you wanted, you're in, um, you're in a lot of trouble. Okay, so we are almost at the end, almost, almost at the end. The last book I'm going to talk about, that's not true. The latest book is Ever. And I'm going to read to you a little bit from Ever. And I am huge in my Mahdi's womb. This takes place in, ancient Mes in a fantasy ancient Mesopotamia. I am huge in my Mahdi's womb, straining her wide tunic. She is Hanu. Akin goddess of the earth and of pottery. My Pado Arduk, god of agriculture, sits at Hanu's bedside, awaiting my birth. It is too tight in Hanu's belly. I thread my strong wind into her womb, and my strong wind thrusts me flying out. And so this is the god of the wind. And so I'm going to end, <clears throat> I'm going to end with a funny thing with this. The first title that I call this, it's told by two narrators, the god of the wind and a girl of the, a mortal girl of the city of height. And she loves to dance and I called it Dancing the Wind, which I loved. But my publisher thought it was, not my editor, who also loved it, my publisher thought it was not a strong enough title. So, um, I thought, and I couldn't come up with anything, and finally I said to them, you want a strong title? I got one for you. We'll call it Gone with the Wind. <laughs> so, um, so eventually I came up with Ever, which I love as a title. And I just, I just want to end with, this is the next book I'm just going to show you. Um, Fairies and the Quest for Neverland is the next one that will be out in June. And this um, will be out in the, in, the fall, in the fall or August, I think. This is Betsy Red Hoodie. Um, and I just love what he's done because not only now, they're not only on feet, they have, on two feet, they have hats, they have backpacks, one of the sheep carries a guitar. Uh, the wolf now has a whole outfit before he only had this, the muffler. So, um, but we do have time for questions and I would love to take some questions. Yes? Was it difficult? Yes, it was very difficult and I suffered. Um, I also had a good time. So writing is hard. The serious answer is writing is very hard and sometimes it's a lot of fun. And finishing a book is great. So yes, it was hard. Um, yes, more questions. Yes? I'm curious 
Um, what are my inspirations? My original inspiration is the great books that I read uh, when I was a kid. I mean, that's what I draw from all the time. Um, when I'm stuck, I stare out the back window, which overlooks um, a very beautiful hemlock tree. That helps. Walking the dog can help. Um, it's internal, it's internal. Um, It's internal. <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, yes. <laughs> I have an Airedale. And I, did I bring, I'm not sure if I brought his picture or not. Let's see, did I bring his picture? Is he in there? He would be at the back. I may have. No. There's a picture of you with your dog on the publisher's website. On the publisher's website and also on my blog. GailCarsonLevine.blogspot.com. I know that Trish said that earlier, but it bears repeating. The web, the blog is all about writing. So, um, so I hope that if you're, if this is an interest, you'll find it interesting. Um, yes. What made me want to be a writer? Um, the great books that I read as a kid are the reason that I'm a writer. But I didn't know I wanted to be a writer until I was 39 years old. And it was, um, it was, I was meditating and I started to tell myself a story. I was always a big reader. So um, that's how it began. Um, and also, when I was little, I never met an author. Um, and the books that I loved the most, the authors were dead. So it was, you know, I wasn't likely to meet one of them. Um, so I didn't think of that as a possibility. It took me a long time to think that I might, that that was possible for me. Um, yes? Could you tell us a secret about what it's like to have a book become a film? Uh -huh. A secret? A secret about that. A secret. Um, geez. I mean, I have talked about that a lot. I mean, the, it's, it was worth it for me. It brought a lot of people to the book, and it's, it's kind of a fun movie. Um, I'm really drawing a blank on a secret. Um, I mean, I had, I had mostly a good experience. This is what I tell, but it's not such a secret, but it'll sound like a secret, um, is that I, when I first read the script, um, I didn't understand why they had to put in a uh, talking snake and an evil uncle. And so I asked the screenwriter, and she said, well, without them, prepare yourself for what I'm about to say. Without that, them, it would just be a cat fight. A cat fight. So I was stunned. She was a female writer. I was stunned. So there's not a secret, but it's the truth. Yes? Why did Ella have to have a curse? Why did Ella have to have a curse? Um, well, when I first thought of retelling Cinderella, I thought, she's so disgustingly sweet. You know, she's so good to everybody that I didn't like her. I don't know if you like people who are always sweet, but I don't. <laughs> and I didn't understand her either. Um, she did everything that she was told. And those mean stepsisters told her to do terrible things. And she just did them. So I didn't understand her. And it's hard to write a story about somebody you don't understand and you don't like. And so I had to give her that curse because then She's not really disgustingly sweet because she has to do what she's told. And that's how she got the curse. But um, the other reason is that curse is terrible, isn't it? She suffers because of it. That's my job. My job is to make my characters suffer. 
<laughs> and I want my characters to suffer. Why do I want my characters to suffer? Anybody? Why do you think I want? Yes. So you can make them more interesting. So they're more interesting and then you keep reading because you want, because you're starting to suffer. Ella's really unhappy. Her mother dies. That's very sad. Uh, so you want to keep reading to see if it gets better for her. So um, I want my characters to suffer and I want my readers to suffer. So that's my job. <laughs> And saying that, this is not much of a secret, it's not really well known, saying that I want my characters to suffer um, and that the writer's job is to make her characters suffer, got the book banned in a district in Illinois. So that was pretty astonishing. Um, so let's see, I, I have uh, time for any more questions. Um, Yes. What made you want to write fantasy? I've always had the same genres. What made me want to write fantasy? It's where my mind went immediately. It's, I, it's the minute I started writing, I started writing fantasy, which is because I loved fairy tales. But there wasn't much fantasy when I was a kid. Um, but that's where I went. So that's why. Yes. You would like it or you would not? I think he would like them. I think he would like them. Um, yes, I do. I, I don't know how he would respond to my book about the orphan. That might, be a hard, might have been a hard book for him to read. My mother would, would have adored my books because they're funny. Um, so. I'm pretty, but my father had a good sense of humor too. I think, I think, I wish they could have seen them. Um, okay, anybody else? Probably have time for one more. If anybody wants to, yes? You talk a lot about the influences for your books, but I also know you do a quite a significant amount of research for your books, which is true. Um, do you think people are often misled by the fact that fantasy is not grounded in some form of reality? Can you talk a little bit specifically about ever or some of the other books that have Okay, uh, what have I done for research? Okay, for Ella, I didn't do very much. I looked at costume books, and then I started to get letters from kids, and they would say, I'm so glad I read Ella. Ella Enchanted, you taught me so much about the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And so I started, and Fairest is also, Fairest and Two Princesses are not very good about Middle Ages. But I started to feel guilty. So I've, uh, I started to read about the Middle Ages. And so I've read, I've read books. Um, I read two daily life books for, I've written a mystery, which will be out next year, which does not have yet have a title. It's a fantasy mystery. It takes place in the Middle Ages. And um, the people who are solving the mystery, one is a dragon and one is a girl. And, um, I read, there's a wonderful book by David Macaulay called Castle. It's the best thing about castle architecture. And, um, and I read two books about daily life in the Middle Ages. And forever, I read about daily life in ancient Mesopotamia. I read Mesopotamian myths. I reread the Greek myths. Um, I got familiar enough in both instances to feel that I would know what it felt like to walk down a street, what it would feel like to be in a medieval town, or to be in a medieval castle, or to be in an ancient Mesopotamian town, to be sick in ancient Mesopotamia. Oy vey. you would not want that to happen to you. So uh, yes, there is considerable. But on the other hand, the lovely part of fantasy is that when the facts don't go in the direction that you need the story to go, you can uh, say goodbye to the facts. <laughs> so I want to thank you for being a great audience. This was a lot of fun.